So we're right on time right now, and uh, there's no reason that I can't get started while we're working on this. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jack Estel. I'm a lecturer here in the Department of Economics. Um, I'd like to welcome you all here, and uh, uh, I'm pleased to see so many people here because it actually, for me, wasn't that easy to find. Maybe you guys already knew where it was. Um, but I want to thank you all for taking the time to be here with us tonight. Um, and then Lydia has now stolen most of my thunder about uh, our get-together of the Barstow Economist uh, after this meeting. And of course, for those of you who don't know what the Barstow Economist is, it's a group of people on the internet who share ideas about economics. Uh, it's a Yahoo group, and you're welcome to join. It's called the Barstow Economist at yahoogroups.com. And uh, if you sign up into that, uh, someone will probably encourage you to come back. And uh, we do have these meetings uh, generally around our provocative lectures where we get together and talk person to person, face to face, and not just on the internet. Um, so we will be meeting tonight at Flames, which is at Fourth and San Fernando, as most of you know. And as Lydia said, there'll be some refreshments there and plenty of conversation. So I look forward to seeing you. You're welcome to join us. Um, I'd also like to mention, which Lydia did as well, our next lecture, Tom Palmer will be speaking uh, that is going to be same place, same time here on the 29th, which is a Monday of September, and he will be talking about um, the, the choice between peace, love, liberty versus war, hatred, and oppression. So I hope that you can join us and see what he has to say about that. Uh, this lecture series was started, I guess now it's been almost 14 years ago, to foster our vision of higher education, challenging ideas, and developing critical thinking in an environment of respectful intellectual discourse. So I always say, I hope that you will relax and enjoy this. Lydia says, please don't relax. She doesn't want you to fall asleep. She wants you to be engaged in these ideas. Um, still relax, it's okay. Um, so uh, Dave Scarbeck is going to be speaking tonight uh, to discuss his observations about prison gangs. And he, we will provide an, a question and answer period for about a half an hour at the end of that. Um, so be thinking about questions that this might bring to mind for you. It's our hope that the lecture will show, uh, uh, allow you to get a greater understanding of this idea about gangs and governance, uh, as well as the, the pursuit of knowledge generally. Dave is a lecturer in political economy at King's College London, where he's helping to build a new and exciting political economy department. He received his Bachelor of Science degree from where? San Jose State. State. And uh, for those of you who don't know, several of us in, that are here, including myself, were colleagues and students together. And uh, I have to say a few words about Dave. Um, So when you guys walk into a classroom, <laughs> very few words. But when you guys walk into a classroom, if you're like me, when I when I came back to school, I was always looking around to see who was going to be the person that would show up to class, take great notes, and share them, right? Do all the work. And if you could find that person, if you were smart, you'd get close to them, right? So Dave was that guy. Uh, not only was he that guy, but he's also the guy who was. The, probably one of the best read people that I've ever met. So, you know, it used to be a game with me. I'd read a new book, and then I'd go and I'd say, uh, Dave, uh, I just read this book. He goes, oh, yeah, I read that. <laughs> so you try and find a book that Dave had read already, and that was pretty darn difficult. Um, he has a vast capacity for absorbing literature and an inquisitive mind that led him to study governance in an area that most of us try not to think about. He was interested in informal governance, and that led him to start studying how gangs govern. That, in turn, led to prison gangs, and eventually to the recently published book, The Social Order of the Underworld, which has received favorable reviews from The Economist and from Matt Ridley in the London Times. Um, so I'm just curious, how many people in the audience, you can give me a show of hands, know someone who has been incarcerated or is incarcerated? Yeah, there's a fair number of us. Um, California alone currently has, anybody have an idea of how many people are incarcerated in California currently? 
not quite, not quite that big, but still 140,000 roughly. Uh, that's about 100, uh, around 150 percent of the capacity of the prison system right now. That's also bigger than the city of Berkeley, bigger than the city of Santa Clara. It's not a small number. Still, the experts say that there's a, not a lot of research around incarceration, and most of us know a little about what goes on in prison. Dave has stepped into that void. When I first picked up the book, I thought it was going to be a difficult read. Uh, that didn't turn out to be the case. The first few pages grab you immediately, and I actually read the book cover to cover. And I think that you would be surprised of what Dave was able to pick out of this book. Um, it's fascinating, both in its content as well as the implications in economics, public choice, and political science. Uh, as you probably have seen, we have copies outside. I'm sure that Dave would be happy to sign them. I encourage you to pick up a copy. It's well worth reading. And I won't say anything more about it because Dave will do a lot better job than I will. So let's give him a big hand and welcome him up. I can have to take that one. Thanks, Jack. All right. Yeah, it's great to see everybody today. Can you hear me all right there in the back? Thumbs up. Thanks. So the, the book is about the uh, American prison system, and part of that is about prison gangs. Uh, but I thought I'd maybe start off by saying a little bit about kind of the broader uh, intellectual project or the academic interest here. Um, so I'm an economist, and um, most economists don't study prison, and we don't study prison gangs. Uh, but something that we're very interested in are the rules that govern societies. And that could be studying the rule of law in democracies or under failed states. It could be studying the effectiveness of courts of law. It could be studying the role of democracy in promoting economic development. So what economists and political scientists call these concepts or this field is the study of governance institutions. So governance institutions define and enforce property rights. For example, if someone steals your bike, you can call the police. The police are protecting your right to your property. That's an example of a governance institution. Governance institutions also promote economic activity. They facilitate trade. Uh, an example of a formal governance institution um, would be um, a court. Someone rips you off, uh, um, you know, acts opportunistically in some commercial transaction. You can take those people to court and sue them. And that ability to have recourse to the courts means that you have more assurance, more trust, more willingness to engage in commercial activity. And more commercial activity generates wealth, economic development. So that's what governance institutions are. Economists study them all over the world, uh, in the contemporary setting, historically. We want to understand what rules of the game, what governance institutions lead communities to become peaceful and prosperous, and which rules of the game do the opposite. Sometimes rules can create incentives so that people act in an opportunistic fashion. Sometimes rules encourage us not to produce wealth, but to redistribute wealth. So the basic finding in uh, all of this literature is that if you want a country to grow rich, you need the right governance institutions, the right rules of the game. So this interest in the rules of the game and governance institutions uh, is studied in a variety of different ways. <clears throat> I've talked a little bit about, about formal governance. The, the government creates governance institutions. But it's very clear that much of the governance that exists is not provided by governments. So one example would be uh, eBay. And when you purchase something on eBay, what do you have the option to do after that transaction has been complete? You can give a thumbs up or a thumbs down, right? And why would, why would it be bad for you to give a thumbs down to, to, to the seller? Why would they not approve of that? Come on, shout it out. Don't, don't be shy. There's a reputation problem, right? You're going to be less willing to buy something from somebody who has a bunch of thumbs downs. You're not going to be willing to pay as much. So the threat that you have that, that you will give someone a thumbs down creates an incentive for that seller to hold up their end of the bargain. Right? You with me? Yeah. So that's an example of governance created not by government. And when we look around the world, a vast amount of economic activity takes place outside of formal governance. Um, the informal sector produces a trillion dollars of economic activity every year. Um, half of the world's workers are in the informal economy. They're not registered, regulated, taxed. They have no recourse to employment law. So obviously, much economic activity can take place outside the law. The economist wants to find out why that is or how that is. 
And so the book is a way to try to understand how governance is provided outside of the state, extra legal, outside of the formal legal structures in society. So that's what this is about, and I'll tell you a little bit about um, how these institutions work, how they've changed over time, what are their consequences, and how can we find something better? Uh, how can we find something uh, better than the informal governance that, that gangs create? <clears throat> so prison gangs are inmate groups that are, uh, have restrictive membership. They're mutually exclusive so that if you join one, you can't join another. Membership in these groups often requires a lifetime commitment, a very serious commitment on the part of its members. Um, individuals often identify their gang membership with prominent tattoos. This individual is from the Fresno-based group, and it's pretty easy to tell that by looking at his chest. If you also look on his chest, he's got a couple of bulldog tattoos. What, this, what these tattoos do is they communicate very clearly and credibly which group this individual is affiliated with common feature of prison gangs in California. Uh, this happy fellow has a white power tattoo on his forehead. And it captures well the idea that prison gangs are almost entirely ethnically and racially segregated. And they get white power tattoos on their foreheads. So power, prison gangs are very important. I'll talk about kind of why that is uh, in a bit. Uh, but I want to present a puzzle to you. And the first puzzle is that the first prison in California began in, was a, created in 1851 when the state was created. And for more than 100 years, for more than a century, no groups like those prison gangs existed in any of the state's prisons. Okay, 100 years, no prison gangs. In the late 1950s and through the 1960s, we see the formation of five or seven prison gangs. Okay, they establish themselves, they create a role for what they're doing in these prisons. And after the 1970s, uh, the number of prison gangs increases, the number of members increases, and more importantly, their influence on other inmates increases dramatically. They dominate the inmate social system today. So as a social scientist, it's interesting to ask, if gangs are so important today, why didn't they exist for, for more than 100 years? And that's a little something that I want to kind of offer a uh, potential answer for. And my argument is that gangs form to provide governance. They form to enforce property rights in prison, to facilitate trade in the underground economy. And there are particularities of the situation today that makes them very good at doing that. So that's my, this is my story here. So prison has lots of formal governance. There are correctional officers, prison guards around who are protecting your property, protecting your person. But there's also a dramatic amount of informal uh, governance that exists. And I want to look at three ways that inmates have a demand for governance that the prison officials either can't or won't provide for. It's the dormitory at Mule Creek State Prison. And um, if you look closely, you'll see that there's about three beds per bunk, cramped living conditions. This will hold somewhere around three to 400 individuals. There'll probably be about five or six prison guards ensuring the safety of all of the men in this room. If you have any valuable property, you can put it in one of the, um, uh, can you see that red dot on the bottom? No? OK. Well, I can't point to it, but look, look, look down at the bottom. There are these, these little containers. And if you have anything valuable, you can put it in those little containers to protect it from other people. Now, what I want to give you a sense from this picture of is just that when you're in prison, you may wish to be a little more secure in your person. You may want to be able to go to sleep, take a nap, and not fear that someone's going to take advantage of you or take, it, take your property. Okay? This is an environment filled with people who are potential enemies, potential predators. And on the margin, it makes sense to invest a, a little bit more in the protection of your property. So. Here's another illustration. This is a prison riot that happened at Pelican Bay. Um, and what you're going to see is a situation of insecurity and danger and chaos. And in a world where something like this might happen, you're going to take steps to uh, avoid, your, avoid it, to protect yourself if it does. Um, those poofs of white smoke are from 
uh, pepper spray that's being sent out by the guards to try to quell uh, this, this chaos, this violence. Luckily, these types of activities don't happen nearly as much as they used to, but in a situation where they might happen, it makes sense to create a little more governance. So the first reason why people have a demand for extra legal governance is protection of person and property. This is a picture of Google Maps, and it's a picture of one of the prison yards at San Quentin. Does anybody know what these people are doing? Uh, they, they look like they're having a fight, but they're not having a fight. Does anyone know what they're doing? Well, they're, they're circling around there. What's going on in the circle of people? They're playing basketball. They're playing basketball, and if you look closely, there's a basketball hoop there, and they're playing three on three. In prison, there are a lot of common resources. Anyone can play basketball there. There's a, there's a basketball court that anyone could physically walk to and play. Um, but how many people have access to it in reality? The fact of the matter is that the, the demand for common resources like basketball courts is overwhelmed. Right? There's far more people who want to play basketball than there's room for them to do it. So in situations um, like getting access to basketball courts, handball courts, it, finding places to stand that are desirable in the yard. Um, inmates need to find a way to allocate control of those resources. Here's how one inmate explains it. He says, somebody want to control this basketball court or that basketball court or this weight bench or that weight bench. The CO, the correctional officer, has nothing to do with that. That's amongst the inmates, the convicts. Sometimes you can maybe talk it out, get it settled without the violence. Sometimes you have to bring the violence. So what he's saying, in other words, is that there's lots of people who want to use these resources, and we need to find an efficient allocation mechanism to allocate those. And it could be just a verbal negotiation, or it could be physical force. So the second reason why inmates require governance is because the correctional officers won't allocate these goods for them, and they need to find a way to do it. The third reason why inmates have a demand for extra legal governance is to regulate the underground economy. These are some of the 15,000 cell phones taken from inmates in 2011. Right? Every single one of them is contraband. A recent um, drug test showed that 23% of inmates had drugs in their system. Another 30% of inmates refused to take the drug test, suggesting that very many of them probably had drugs in their system as well. So what we're seeing in prison, in California in particular, is flourishing markets. There are flourishing markets in cell phones. There are flourishing markets in illicit substances in prison. But the problem that the inmates face is that if someone steals your heroin or your tobacco, both contraband, you can't go to the correctional officer to complain about it. You can't go to the guard and say that, I paid for um, more, more heroin than they gave me. Uh, would you punish him, please? Okay? Those types of com commercial conflicts that are bound to arise can't be resolved through prison officials or formal governance. So that's the third reason why inmates require extra legal governance. Now, prior to the formation of prison gangs, prior to the 1960s, the way that inmates solved this problem was in a very decentralized fashion. Um, they relied on reputation. They relied on norms. The beauty of reputation is that the fact that your reputation can be diminished, can be uh, sullied, means that you're going to take steps to avoid that happening. Um, in, the, in this earlier period, inmates followed some pretty common sense norms, some rules. They called them a code. So like, don't, don't inform on people. Don't n be nosy about people. Don't talk about people. Don't steal from people. Don't lie to people. Um, pay your debts back. Don't, don't be weak. Don't whine. These were the norms that inmates followed or encouraged people to follow. They valued these things. And in this period of decentralized governance, if you complained a lot, if you stole from people, your reputation would be diminished. And with a reduced um, reputation, you'd be more likely to be taken advantage of. People wouldn't want to associate with you. They wouldn't want to transact with you uh, for contraband in the illicit economy. All of those things impose a cost. And the potential for that cost to be realized, to come into existence, deterred people from engaging opportunistically in the first place. So one study described these codes in this earlier period as the legal environment of the sub rosa system, or the underground economy. Now, the key to recognize about this earlier period, prior to the 1960s, is that it was entirely decentralized. Individuals were establishing what types of persons they were. It was based on individuals' actions. 
and punishment was decentralized. Sometimes people would get together and jointly assault someone or jointly ostracize someone, but it was very decentralized, and people used their discretion to, say, to decide whether or not someone needed to be ostracized, insulted, uh, assaulted, stabbed, or something more serious. Prisons today are much less decentralized. They're more centralized. And the way that they work is around a community responsibility system based on gang affiliation. Now, there's, there's multiple levels of gang affiliation. Some are very serious, fully made members. Some are more casually affiliated. And many individuals simply affiliate with their racial or ethnic group. And when I talk about gangs, I'm going to kind of conflate all three of those together. Um, but what's important in a community responsibility system is that everyone in a particular prison is affiliated with a particular group. And the key feature of these is that each member of your group is responsible for each individual's actions. Okay? So, <clears throat> a couple stylized groups here. If someone from that green group incurs a debt for drugs from a member of the red group, not only is that individual who borrowed the drugs responsible for repayment, but everyone in his group is responsible for repayment. If he doesn't pay that debt, a variety of different punishments can be placed on that individual. It may be that the group will come up with the resources to make the debt even. It may be that that, that individual has to work off that debt uh, to the delight, to the, to, the, to the ends of the other group. What's common is that if a member of one of those groups doesn't pay back the debt, they'll either hand them over to be assaulted by the rival group, or what's more common is they'll assault the individual themselves to the satisfaction of the other group. So the way that it works, it's not decentralized like that earlier period. It's very centralized. The community has the incentive and the information to control its members, and their reputations are determined or reflected by the individual member's actions. Okay? That means they have an incentive that if these people aren't paying their debts, that they do something to remedy the situation. So one inmate explains it like this says, it was my responsibility on the yard to ensure that our people were not harmed by another race. He says, I took care of the drug debts. If one of our people became delinquent in a drug debt to another race, it was my responsibility to either cover their drug debt or have them stabbed, in which case we would send one of ours to stab them. Okay? That is a, a nice example of the community, the group, taking responsibility for its members' actions. Another individual explains it like this. He insulted someone when he was pretty new to prison. He says, the next thing I know, I'm told to make it right with them. At first I thought, you've got to be kidding me. No way am I going to tell this guy that I'm sorry. Then they told me I have no choice. That's the rule. You do what you're told. They made a very good argument about how I need to fall in line. OK, so I made things right. So what we see is a very centralized and organized enforcement of rules, while in that previous period, it was very decentralized enforcement. Um, just one last quote, uh, quote here. This guy says, we need to keep the boys in line. If one of our guys is a hothead or something and is always shooting off his mouth, it can get everyone into trouble. We don't want a lockdown. We don't want a riot. If one of my guys is messing up, then we either offer him up to the other guys or we take him down ourselves. So when this community responsibility system works well, you, you hear facts like this. You see regulation. You see governance like this. And it works well. In order for these gangs to provide that governance, they need information about people. And they need information about who follows the rules that they deem acceptable, who violates them. They need information about how a stranger that they just met has acted in the past, what their reputation is. And they rely on a variety of different um, organizational features to, to do that. Okay? They send a lot of letters. They send a lot of notes uh, surreptitiously. Um, many groups keep enemies lists or no good lists. And these lists provide the names of people who have violated their gang rules in the past and who deserve, according to them, to be assaulted um, if, if stumbled upon. So in a lot of prisons in California, when you arrive, the gang leader, the shot caller, is going to send in a, what, what is a, essentially an informal questionnaire to you to ask who you are, what crimes you've committed. They want to see your paperwork. They're going to find out what gangs you're affiliated with, what neighborhoods you're from. And they're going to get that information. They're going to double check it in your court paperwork to make sure that you are who you say you are. And then they're going to double check it against their own list, like this one, to see if you violated some gang rules in the past. The top section identifies entire gangs 
who are on this enemies list. So any, if, if anybody enters um, this particular prison and is from one of those gangs, then they're going to be assaulted. That second group, personals, has to do with particular individuals who've done something to transgress these, these rules in the past who are going to be punished if they're, if they're found out. And what's most interesting to me is that last list, the passes list. These are people who were previously in the other two sections but did something to make, make it right. right? They, they righted their wrong in the past, and as a result, um, they, they, they won't be assaulted next time they're identified. And in order for rules to work well, you need to have incentives to not break the rules. And if you break the rules, you need incentives to make it right. So if this passes section wasn't on there, then the people who are destined to be assaulted would have no incentive to, to resolve the problem in the way that's acceptable. Right? If you're going to be assaulted whether you make it right or not, there's no reason to make it right. So the ability to get off of an enemies list like this provides a powerful incentive for people to right their wrong ways. <clears throat> Um, none of this is, is um, unknown or, or new information to people who work in prisons or go to prisons. Um, a former correctional officer says, when you come to prison, you have to join a gang. You have no choice. It's a must. Because you have, your, you have no protection, you're on your own, and anything can happen to you. A former warden at San Quentin Prison admitted in a, a very public interview, he said, the Department of Corrections has pretty much given over control of the general populations to gangs. Okay? So it's no secret that gangs provide this governance role and that they have a tremendous influence over other inmates. Here's my water. No, OK. <laughs> so what I want to do, if you'll recall, I started off with this puzzle of prison gangs. They're very important today, but they didn't exist for a century. So what I want to do is rely on some of the tools in social science to explain that change. And so I'm going to kind of rephrase it as, saying there is an earlier period of decentralized reputation-based governance, and now we have a more centralized gang-based governance. And what we can do is we can go and look at the academic literature that studies reputations, that studies decentralized governance systems, and say, based on past work, when do those things work well and when do they fail? So I'm going to argue that there's four main reasons why we switched from decentralized governance to gang-based governance. Okay? Uh, the first is that norms, or norms are um, what determine what your rep whether your reputation is, is good or not, norms are less effective in large populations. Now, why might that be? Oh, <laughs> oh no, no. <laughs> so why are norms less effective in large populations? That's exactly right. Large groups have more anonymity, so it's easier to get away with it. So if we're in a small classroom, maybe there's only 10 of us, and you're someone who consistently eats um, smelly food, everybody knows you're that jerk who eats smelly food. And they avoid you when you're walking down the hallways. Everyone knows your reputation. It's very easy for that to have a powerful effect on you. But if you're in a bigger room, if you're in a room like this, or if you're in the airport, when you're in a big population, it's more difficult for you to know everyone's reputation. Right? It's more difficult to get to know those people. It's more difficult to communicate that information to other people. So when you have big populations, norms, reputations are much less effective. And if you can't communicate someone's reputation, then the threat of tarnishing that reputation doesn't constrain bad behavior. A second situation is that when norms are less effective when people don't know the norms. Okay? If, if you don't know that it's rude to do something and you continue to do it, then that, that norm that is not going to have any constraint on you. So I live in London now, and I frequently find that something that I've been enjoying or doing for one or two years uh, since I've been there is considered very strange. And it's like, that's the strange American. One example is talking on the, the subway. No English people ever talk on the subway. But I didn't know this, so the first six months I'm there, I'm just gabbing away like a loud American. So I didn't know that. So the threat that my reputation would be diminished by doing it is ineffective, because I don't know that I shouldn't be doing it. So if you don't know the norms, it's much less, they're much less effective in controlling what people deem to be bad behavior. There's a related issue to that, too, which is if I don't know the norms, not only might I violate them and cause some conflict, but I also can't enforce those norms when other people violate them. Right? I can't regulate other people's adherence to that norm if I don't know what they are. Norms also fail 
uh, when there's more young people. Okay. Young people are much more willing to violate commonly accepted wisdoms, practices, values, behaviors, and that's why young people are great. But it means that it undermines the effectiveness of a decentralized governance regime. And then finally, norms are less effective when a community is more uh, heterogeneous. They're less effective the more diverse in a variety of ways that it is. And the way to think about this is to think about communities that are highly homogenous. So think about the Amish community. These are people who have very similar, very tightly, very agreed upon values about what society should look like. They all pray to the same God. They all read the same Bible. They all believe in this, what is right and what is wrong and what the punishment should be for violating those things. In that type of a situation, decentralized governance is effective. It, it's much easier to work. On the other hand, if it's highly um, diverse, if our cultural, historical, social, religious, moral practices diverge substantially, decentralized governance is less effective because we dispute about what is and isn't right and what the acceptable punishments is uh, when they're violated. So those are four different reasons why we would expect decentralized reputations to be ineffective, to not be able to control what these people deem to be bad behavior. And so surprise, surprise, I'm going to show you data suggesting that I'm right about all of these things. Okay? So the first one is that norms are less effective in large populations. What we should expect to see then is that norms fail and a new form of governance is needed when bigger prison populations arise. Okay? When norms fail, people turn to gangs to provide the governance that norms previously did but could no longer provide. So that's the prison population in California from 1851 to about 1920. It's always relatively low. It's stable. There's an average of about 1,000 inmates per year over that period, never more than 3,000 people. There's a dramatic increase, about five-fold, uh, up to 1970. So during the period that prison gangs form, the prison population grows larger than ever before, more quickly than ever before, and a, a more sustained period than ever before. What this is, is a picture of low information costs when reputations are effective, rising information costs when we should expect reputations to be less effective in controlling behavior, and that corresponds to the time that we see gangs initially forming. So here's the data uh, that was on the last slide. And the current uptick in incarceration in California is dramatically more. A height of about 180,000 inmates down from that but what that is is a world where you don't know most people. Most people are strangers. You don't know if they're trustworthy or not. You don't know if they have a good reputation or not. And we should expect decentralized governance to be non-existent or ineffective during that period. And that's consistent with what we see. This is data on the average total inmates per facility, which increases from less to 1,000 to 4,400. 4, 4, and on top of that, not only are there more prisoners, but they're spread out over more prisons, from about five prisons to 34 prisons today. That makes information even more costly because not only are we all in the same room, and there's a lot of us, but there's actually people transferring to different prisons and communicating whether or not someone is trustworthy in some prison far away when that person gets here is more costly to do. So all these things are going to undermine your ability to keep track of who should be considered trustworthy and who shouldn't. So that's consistent with my argument here uh, about reputations. The second is that reputations are less effective if people don't know them. And the people in prison who are less likely to follow these codes of behavior are people who have never been there before. What this data shows is that during the period that prison gangs form, the percentage of people in prison who had served a prior prison commitment and therefore were knowledgeable or likely to be more knowledgeable about the norms declined from about 60% to about 30% during the period that prison gangs formed. So now we have two factors pushing in the same direction. You have more inmates spread over more prisons, and more of those prisoners haven't been in prison before. Okay? Both of these make norms less effective. In a study of longtime serial felony offenders, um, they asked people in the early 90s who had been in prisons uh, for several decades ab about this. And, and what they found to summarize their results was that new inmates had not been socialized into the convict culture, the codes of good behavior, 
and the rules of codes of behavior were no longer adhered to. So the people who lived in these prisons during this change recognized this fact. They said that there's a bunch of new people who come to prison and they don't know how to serve their time like they should. This is uh, data showing the age of people in prison. And what it shows is that prior to the 1970s, the number of male inmates arriving annually who were under the age of 30 was always about fewer than 3,000 people. And as you can see, um, annually, you know, I think the latest date is 2009 that I have data for, is you have 20,000 new young male inmates entering prison. Young males, as some of you may have noticed, are troublesome people, okay? They commit a, a vast majority of the crime. They're much more willing to cause trouble, to um, be disruptive to social order. So that tacks on to the, the, the difficulty of using decentralized governance to control uh, people's behavior. <laughs> Dave, yeah, thank you, John. There's also a remarkable change in the ra racial and ethnic makeup of inmates um, rel now relative to earlier. So what this shows us is that in 1950, prior to the time that prison gangs first started forming, two, um, there was two white inmates for every one black or Hispanic inmate. And that's reversed remarkably now. Now it's three black or Hispanic inmates to every one white inmate. And what that represents is an increasing of diversity, or sociologists use the term social distance. There's less homogeneity that we can rely on for these decentralized norms to be effective. There's also a shift during this period over who should control things. And more people means you have more ability to assert control over resources that you want to use in prison. And what we see here is a reversal with among racial and ethnic groups over that. So we should see disruptions to the, uh, to the order that exists. <clears throat> so during the 1960s, we see the formation of prison gangs. These groups, all of them, when you look at the histories, they all form initially for protection. Um, everyone agrees with this. Uh, correctional officers who worked in prisons at that time, early gang members, they say that we started this gang because we wanted, to be, we wanted protection. We wanted safety. Well, there's an advantage that comes from the formation of a gang. You protect yourself. But there's important commercial implications now that that type of organization comes into existence. So what, there's a problem about selling anything valuable that's contraband in prison which is that if you have something valuable and you want to sell it, you have to make its existence known to other people, other people who might want to take it from you. A gang, because they can protect themselves, means they have a credible threat to protect the property that they then want to sell. A sole proprietor, by comparison, if went out and said, I've got lots of valuable marijuana, and it was just a single individual, he wouldn't have that marijuana for very long. right? He wouldn't be able to protect himself. So the structure that gangs adopt to protect themselves gives them a comparative advantage of participating in the illicit economy, the underground economy in prison. And after the period that these prison gangs form in 1970, we see the increase in consumers of illicit substances entering into the prison system. We see a major profit opportunity for people who can supply contraband in prison. So the, the straight line shows the total number of people who admit to having an addiction uh, when entering the prison system. Um, in the 1960, that's fewer than 2,000. By 1980, that's 12,000 people entering the prison system who are consumers of contraband. And if you can supply those people, you can make a substantial profit in doing so. The percentage of inmates in 1980, uh, nearly 80% of inmates admitted having an addiction, having a, a desire for illicit substances. And Prison gangs have the opportunity to meet those needs, to supply that need, and they, they benefit from doing so. Here's a, another picture to, to supplement the last one. This is the number of drug offenders entering prison each year and being in prison every year. And it's important, of course, to note that not all people convicted of drug offenses are drug users, but there's certainly some overlap. What we see is that into the 1990s and 2000s, there's regularly tens of thousands of people entering the prison system with uh, some participation in, in the drug community. Okay? If you can supply those drugs, you get money, you get power, you have an important role uh, amongst your peers. An interesting implication of that or consequence of that is that 
gangs want order so that they can profit in illicit markets. And when there's social conflict, that undermines their ability to make money selling contraband. So one inmate says, we don't fight in a riot and stuff unless we have to. If I'm locked down, then I'm not working. You can make some serious bank in prison, and shot callers hate it when you're in lockdown. So the ability to make substantial profits in the underground economy actually creates an incentive for gangs to create some order. And it's, it's, not a very, it's not a pure order. It's not a first best order. It's not a desirable order in many ways. But there is an incentive there to regulate conflict, regulate insults and assaults against people. So I've told a little story here about why gangs come into existence, what they do, and why they have an incentive, despite entirely self-interested reasons, to create governance that has some beneficial aspects to other people. But by no means are gangs um, uh, entirely unproblematic. So as an economist, I, I'd like to start first with thinking about productive efficiency. So how well do they produce what they produce? They produce it at lowest cost possible? Well, the volume of contraband that exists in California prisons is substantial. It's remarkable. And that, that flourishing of trade is an indication that the rules they create are effective for doing that. There's no reason why we should accept that or, en or enjoy the fact that they, they have so much contraband. But it's, it's, a, it's a signal that they're do what they're doing, they're doing well. Um, another downside, however, is that gangs undermine rehabilitation. The fact that you're um, forced to affiliate, uh, adopt the, the rules, some of the values of, of gang members, doesn't help people when they re-enter society. Right? It undermines their social capital. It undermines their ability to uh, gain full employment in uh, the, the legal economy. <clears throat> It's also a major issue with equity in gangs. There's a certain class of inmates, as many of you probably know, they're no good, they're of poor status. So people think of sex offenders, former law enforcement officers, informants. These people are treated entirely unequally uh, by the rules created by the gangs. <clears throat> we, we care a bit about how adaptable and resilient or robust rules are. So if you have a rule that governs your, your, your little community, but it easily fails, then that lacks robustness. That's not a good rule. A good rule is one that you can throw all kinds of problems at, and it always leads to a good situation. Um, gangs are, are the, the, the rules created in prisons are, are fairly adaptable, resilient, and robust. They were able to take in not just a dramatic increase in the population, but also a population of people who tend to be less cooperative and trustworthy than uh, the community uh, on average. <clears throat> very little accountability amongst gangs, and they don't conform very much to kind of general commonly held morality. They value greed and power um, much more than other, uh, other uh, aspects. So what this slide is supposed to communicate is that we can appreciate their ability to create rules to increase economic activity, but that's by no means uh, an overall appraisal, uh, a positive appraisal of their activities. So I've offered an explanation about why gangs exist. It's to provide extra legal governance. And other people have different explanations. So what I want to do is I want to go through some of those explanations, and I want to convince you that all of those explanations are totally wrong, so mine must be, must be more right. Okay. <clears throat> So the, the most commonly suggested explanation is that gangs form as a vehicle to promote violence. They help people to do violence. And anytime you read a newspaper article about prison gangs, it's always violent prison gang. Right? Well, what's happened during the period that prison gangs didn't exist and then have become very important? If this is true, then we should see an increase in violence in prisons. But that's not the case. American prisons have become remarkably safer and less violent during the period that prison gangs formed. This is the rate of prison riots per 100,000. In the 1970s, it was commonly more than uh, 40, 50, 80 per year. And as you can tell, if you look to the bottom left of the square, it's very frequent that, that prison riots are remarkably more rare than before. They're much more orderly in the absence of riots. This is the inmate on inmate homicide rate. From 1973 to 2003, it fell 94%. And in 2003, the inmate homicide rate was lower than the homicide rate out in the free world. Okay? So 
prison is remarkably safer. This is a, it's not just a, a homicides, also just assaults, fights. This has declined as well, not as dramatically since the 1980s. So if prison gangs form just because they are violent people who like to be violent, they're not doing a very good job about it, right? Because things are becoming much less violent. A common explanation in some criminology work is the importation theory, the idea that prison gangs exist because street gangs come into existence, import their organizational structure into the prison system. So it's a plausible story, and if it was true, what we would expect to see is that prison gangs form earliest in those states where street gangs form earliest. Because if a street gang isn't there, then they can't import their organizational structure. This is data that shows the year that prison gangs are first identified in a variety of states. And the takeaway from this information is that the importation theory is not true. Places like Utah, Pennsylvania, Iowa, Nevada, Arkansas, North Carolina had prison gangs at a very early period. They also had a large number of them. But they had very few or no street gang problems. So it can't be true. California is very high on the list. And you could look to the gangs of Los Angeles and say, that fits the story well. But there's a, a few things to, to qualify that conclusion. One is that the first prison gang that formed was indeed formed by gang members, street gang members. But they weren't from the same organization. They didn't just start their organization anew behind bars. They came from different gangs. And they created an organizational structure that was very different from their street gang structures. The second, is the, the second prison gang that formed was specifically not street gang members. They were people who were targeted by other people in prison because they were rural farm workers. And so they banded together for protection. It entirely contradicts the idea that street gangs import into the prison system. <clears throat> we could look to state level policy changes. And there's many claims that uh, when the state started using what's called an indeterminate sentencing regime, which is that you don't know how long you'll be in prison. It could be one years or 15 years, and they'll decide when you've been reformed. Uh, that's commonly pointed to as a cause for prison gang growth, because people felt agitated at the uncertainty that this rule created. If that was true, we would expect to see all inmates affected by that policy change to form prison gangs. And that's not what we see. That's not true. Has anyone seen Orange is the New Black? Yeah. It's a nice show. The book is a lot, uh, is, is much different, of course, from the show. And when you read the book, and it's also shown in, the, in, the, in the, the show, that they don't have gangs in the way that these male prisons have gangs, right? And in fact, women prisons in California have never had the strict level of racial and ethnic segregation that exists in male prisons. And they've never had anything like lifetime commitment to organize prison gang groups. So according to my theory, uh, that, should only, um, that should depend on all of those different factors that make norms effective or not. So let's look at some of the data. Here's the female inmate population. And when you look at it, you can tell that it looks as a similar shape to the male population. There's a tremendous increase. What's different about these two populations? What's that? So the largest number of female inmates in California was just about 12,000. Compare that with the male population, right? Female prisons still resemble the types of communities that existed in male prisons prior to the 1960s. They're small. Reputations are effective. So we shouldn't see these organized gangs coming into existence. And in fact, we don't see that. Racism. Gangs formed to promote hateful, racist ideologies. Clearly, many prison gang members are um, prejudiced. And they adopt symbols to communicate that prejudice. There's two problems with that. One is that many prison gang members, even with kind of alarming insignia, say that they're not racist. The second is that since at least the 1940s, measures of prejudice in society at, at large have fallen dramatically. So I don't think few people would argue that there is as much racism and prejudice in America today as there was 80 years ago. So there's been a dramatic decline in racial prejudice at the same time that these gangs are forming. So if the gangs are forming to promote racism, we should see the opposite of that, them becoming less prevalent over that period. Uh, one gang member said something along the lines of, 
when you say Aryan Brotherhood, everyone focuses on the Aryan part. But the brotherhood part is what's important. And that brotherhood part is the community responsibility system. This is the data on discrimination becoming the racial, racial beliefs uh, diminishing over time. So why do gangs, why are gangs racially and ethnically segregated if they're not formed primarily to promote racism? Well, my argument is that in an environment of all males, strangers, who all wear the same clothes, have similar haircuts, are all um, within a, a pretty narrow age range, the piece of information, the way to identify as soon as possible what group someone's affiliated with is to see, see their face, right? to, see their, to see that. And if you see that, then that's going to provide a lot of information very quickly about who's responsible for this person's actions. You don't need to know that person. You don't need to know their behavior. If you know which group they're affiliated with, and race seems to be a very low cost thing to provide, then that's going to have a powerful effect in establishing some order uh, in prisons. So maybe we want to talk a little bit about some of the conclusions here. So my argument is that gangs form to provide governance. And if this is true, it helps to explain historical variation. So why prison gangs didn't exist before and do exist now. It helps explain why large prison systems like Texas and California have very entrenched prison gang problems. Other places like Wyoming, um, um, other smaller states, New Hampshire, Vermont, don't have a prison gang problem because those prison systems are small. Decentralized governance is effective. It helps explain why males form prison gangs and is consistent with claims about why females don't form prison gangs. And it also helps explain the world around us when we look at prison systems around the world. So in England and Wales, uh, where I live, they don't have prison gangs at all like we do. They also have small prison populations. Their formal governance is also run much more effectively than American prisons. So inmates have less need, less demand to create governance on their own. What happens in Latin American prisons? Go to Mexico, go to Brazil, go to Bolivia. These are places where the formal governance is as minimal as it can be. Prisons whose formal governance is simply guards that won't let you leave. They don't provide food. They don't provide shelter, housing, medical support. They provide nothing that inmates need. So with no formal governance, inmates have remaining demand for extra legal governance. And that's one of the reasons why gangs are so important in, in establishing and regulating social order in those communities. When we look at Scandinavian prisons, um, it's like going on vacation, it looks like, right? They have beautiful apartments, just a few people that they live with. They can cook steaks in very nice kitchens. When you see pictures of Scandinavian prisons, we, most of us probably wouldn't be able to identify it as a prison. Okay? These are places where the formal governance is abundant and effective. So inmates don't have a need to create extra legal governance to find informal ways to provide it. <clears throat> so if my argument's right, there are important public policy implications. Um, the first is that the, the, very, the key uh, technique that prison officials across the country use to control gangs are suppression-based, or what I think of as supply-side-based, which is if they find out you're in a gang, you're sent to the most restricted housing available. They find out that you're active in the gang, they remove all of your privileges. Okay? They're targeting the supply of gang members, the supply of governance, what happens if you were to eliminate um, all, of the, all of the best bars in downtown San Jose? So you shut down San Jose Bar and Grill today. Where is there a profit opportunity tomorrow? To go out and open another one, to open another bar, right? So there's a demand. if there's a demand for something, then pr removing the supply isn't going to re remove that problem, right? Entrepreneurs are going to step into the process. And prison officials consistently explain that any time you take out one leader, someone else has been groomed and is ready to step in. For every one you take out, there's 10 more who are happy to take over. So by targeting the supply side, we have these incredibly restrictive and punitive housing, secure housing units, administrative segregation. And what they do is they just isolate certain individuals, but they don't solve the problem. So my argument is that we need to target not the supply side, but the demand side. 
if gangs form because people have a demand for what they do, provide protection, then let's provide them protection. Why should people have to rely on gangs for safety when prison officials can do that job instead? So the main way that we can undermine the strength of prison gangs isn't by increasingly punitive segregated housing, it's through providing what inmates want, which is they want to be safe, they want their property be, to be protected. Related to that, we've made so many different items that inmates have a demand for Ill illegal. You're not allowed to smoke in prisons in California since 2005. Every time you outlaw something, you push it into the hands of gangs. So a more liberal prison economy, one that didn't require um, incredibly expensive uh, phone, pay, pay phone service, would be one where gangs were less, less powerful. So we should target the demand side by keeping inmates safe and liberalizing the prison economy and taking profits out of the hands of the gang members. I'll just skip, skip that part. America has a criminal justice system that is in substantial, substantial trouble, okay? And we incarcerate more people than any country on earth. Uh, that's almost ever incarcerated people before. Um, and we can do better. This is a panopticon in Cuba. And initially devised by English philosopher Jeremy Bentham, the idea of the panopticon is that you can monitor everyone at the same time, all of the time. And a guard would sit in that middle tower and he could look into each one of those cells. Now, there's practical problems with the panopticon, but what we need to think about is ways that we can do incarceration better, that we can change the way we lock people up so that they're safer. One is changes to architecture. Others are changes to technology. Many prisons have, San Quentin has remarkably few video cameras throughout the prison living area. There's no cameras there. Cam we all have cameras, right? We've got cameras on our houses, we've got drones, we've got phone cameras. It's so cheap to install a camera. Why don't we have cameras monitoring these people's lives so that if someone's hurt, we can do something about it, even if they don't want guards to do something about it? So we need to think critically about how to make prisons safer. There's vast amounts of research on it, and these things just need to be implemented. Um, this is the prison population in the United States, it's about 2.2 million. It's more than every country. We have 800,000 more prisoners than China does, a country that has a billion more people than us. Okay? You can't control big prison populations. This is the rate of incarceration, too. When you have large prison populations, you can't regulate, you can't control, you can't protect. So we, if we want to address the prison gang problem, we need to start thinking about better ways to control crime. There's many options, hiring more police, community corrections, rehabilitative services, and prison. We need to think about where we can shift people out of prisons and into alternative treatment uh, opportunities. So the onion. 15 years in an environment of constant fear somehow fails to rehabilitate prisoners. And you know that's somewhat funny because it's true and it's sad. And if people have no opportunities to rehabilitate themselves, to improve themselves, um, you're going to generate the types of ongoing um, reoffending rates that have led to the, the high incarceration rates currently. So I started off by talking about um, why an economist would want to study the prison system and made an argument about why gangs exist, what, what, what purpose they serve. There's also some broader lessons that we can think about here. So we want to understand inmates face a unique problem in the particular, the specifics of the case, but they face a problem that everybody in any society faces. We all want our person safe, our property safe, and we all want to find ways to trade uh, in a more reliable, trustworthy environment. Right? That's true of uh, all, all modern countries today, throughout history. Gangs have solved that problem in a unique way because they're limited in very important ways. Um, what the study of prison shows us is that norm-based governance doesn't scale up very well. And it doesn't scale up very well. It, we can't have norm-based governance in large populations, even if people are willing to use violence. Right? Violence, violence could make norms effective in large communities because even though you don't know someone's reputation, there's a chance that you'll be killed if you violate some law. Well, the prisons show that that's not true. The second is that, as in many social situations, 
solving these problems doesn't require a vast amount of wealth. It's not that there's like we need a big push of finances and outside funding, um, foreign aid, to solve governance issues. These problems are solved not through any increase in wealth, but through in how they structure the incentives and information of people living in that community. So that's the goal. If you want social order and governance, put the right information in the hands of people who have an incentive to use it in a way that's socially beneficial. The third point, the more general point, is that agent type is not determinate. So there are lots of people in prison who are fully trustworthy, cooperative, innocent, but on average, that community is less trustworthy than the community on average. Right? They're, if they're not less trustworthy, they're more willing to violate rules. And some of those rules maybe they shouldn't be rules, but they're more likely to violate those. That means that cooperation between these individuals should be more difficult in this instance. And what we see is that that's not so. They cooperate perfectly fine. Uh, and when they have the right rules available, uh, they're not hindered uh, by any potential biases. And then finally, this is an example of how social order emerges spontaneously. This wasn't created like from the top down. People who consistently faced the same sets of problems sought out solutions to those problems. They found out what worked, what didn't work, and they inched their way to um, social institutions, governance institutions, that were a little more, a little more, a little more effective at achieving the ends that they desired. So I'll, I'll stop there, and I'd be delighted, delighted to take uh, questions if anyone has any. Yeah. Yeah, no, there's definitely different rules between the groups. And the rules are more general, I think. The international rules, as some people call them in, in, in Chicago, uh, the international rules are, are, very, are very basic. Um, one of those would be, for example, uh, limitations on how much drugs people can buy or use in advance. So how much in debt can they incur? And both gangs have an incentive to regulate that, because if someone gets too much, then that causes conflict for everybody. Um, but many of these gangs have very detailed internal rules about how often they have to participate in group workouts, how often they have to circulate information uh, to higher ups and stuff like that. So there's definitely different sets of rules to solve different problems. One is about conflict with outsiders, the other is about facilitating cooperation with insiders. So what I was really wondering if you could take a look at one of the So, uh, Dave, um, when you looked at like white collar prisons around the like countryside around where I grew up, <laughs> and like the Santa Barbara jail or things like that, um, did they keep people in jail or was it pretty much the same? Yeah, well, it's it's good of you to think ahead. Um. <laughs> well, I may be different. <laughs> uh, those communities are, are communities. Um, the, 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 they're not quite country clubs, um, but federally managed prisons are typically more effective than state-run prisons. The governance that federal prisons provide is more effective. They're safer, um, they're, they're better regulated, they have cameras in them. So there's federal prisons like those have better formal governance. The types of clientele have less demand for contraband, uh, underground economy, drug, drug trading in the prison. So there's less demand for what the gangs provide. And as a result, correspondingly, they have a much, uh, much reduced presence. There's some, less, of a, less of a hold and regulation on, on social life there. Then there is a, a community responsibility and affiliation, um, but it's much less um, uh, strict.
wars that have alternative to military service may have something to do with where we diverted young people to get out of Poland <coughs> Absolutely, people could be diverted from incarceration by going uh, not to prison but to war. And that helps to explain why the levels of incarceration were low. Um, is that what you're asking? Yeah, I mean, so that, that's, a, that's an important part of the question of why does California send people to prison? Or, or over time, why does that change? And war is one, one outlet for that. It's less relevant to understanding, given the people that are in prison, how do they organize their, their social community? Yeah. So we imprison a lot of people due to either marijuana possession or marijuana usage. Should we legalize this drug in order to take a lot of nonviolent offenders out of the prison system to push to uh, decrease the overall number of youth out of the prison? I, I, it's not true that we incarcerate lots of people for using marijuana. Um, about 20% of the increase in the prison population is due to drug offenses. I, I'm not sure, yeah, I, I, I might be, make the bold claim that no one's gone to prison for marijuana possession. Um, so that, that wouldn't be the, the driving reason to legalize drugs. I think a, a more persuasive argument to me would be that um, legal, Ill, illegal drugs um, have a lot of negative externalities, and they cry out for governance. So the same story is going on here. If drug dealers on the streets can't rely on courts of law to adjudicate their commercial activity, they need extra legal governance. And that's where you see the formation of these gangs. And that is not uh, a very desirable form of, of control. So uh, those are the types of arguments that I think um, would be pers more persuasive. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, there, there, uh, there's no, no, nothing, never. <laughs> now, going into prisons in a, a formal capacity is never, I've never felt uneasy or, or uh, not nearly as much as going to a, a tough academic seminar. Yeah, so the, the, the typical female prison has a much smaller percentage of violent offenders relative to male prisons. So there's less need for safety if you think that violent offenders are more likely to be violent in prison. The way that they organize themselves is you know, typically through families, which will be two, three, maybe four women will have a sort of little group. Um, sometimes they take on roles as mother, father. They take care of kids. They have a little social unit, a little family. Um, it plays, a, in a way, the community responsibility type of role. But unlike gangs, membership isn't permanent. It's not mutually exclusive. It's much more loose, varied. You can go from one family and leave and join another family. They don't get the same types of uh, dramatic tattoos, typically, as male prisons do. And uh, so it, it's, very, it's very much more decentralized than that. And part of that is because there's fewer people, so the reputations work. Part of that is that there's fewer violent offenders, so that there's less, people feel less concern. Um, all, that's, th those are the, I guess, the main causal explanations that I'd, I'd put forward. Um, I have no idea. I don't know. <laughs> um, 
I've never, I've never interviewed people about that, and I don't know of any studies uh, on that. The people, the, the informal prison layer, the drug dealers in prison have to pay a tax, a, a, a fee to the gang. Uh, but I don't know about people involved in the prison industry. Yeah, yeah. Um, some people don't want to talk about it. That's perfectly understandable. Um, the most typical uh, respondent that I've interviewed um, thinks that this is entirely uninteresting and unexceptional. And uh, I guess my sense of that is that if you don't know the problems, uh, the context, the situation of incarceration, then you might have no idea what to expect. But life in prison is very regulated, and it's the rules are just kind of uh, taken for granted in a sense. So in that sense, most of the people that I talked to didn't know why I wanted to ask them about something boring like who gets to use the basketball court. They're harsher in many ways, and there, there's, there's more nuanced laws. Um, pe people go to prison for many, they call it charge stacking, right? So it's not just one offense, but five related offense that you'll go for. 97% of people who are uh, plead guilty, who are, are guilty, found guilty, 97% of those do a plea bargain. So the idea that you go before a jury of your peers to be judged for some particular crime is, is a, a myth. It doesn't happen anymore, it's just about. And we have s s more punitive laws, three strikes laws. Um, uh, those affect relatively few people. Um, they represent a small proportion of people who go into prisons. There's no evidence that prison sentences are getting longer. The median prison sentence over the last 30 years is about two years in California. So most people don't go to prison for a long time. Um, so we have punitive laws, uh, but they don't translate necessarily into, you know, remarkably long prison sentences. Uh, absolutely. So in the UK, they don't have optional drug testing. They have mandatory random drug testing on a very frequent basis and severe punishments if you're found to, you know, to, to have a dirty, dirty test. And that makes it much more risky to do drugs, and it takes away some of the profit opportunity. So what we really need to do is liberalize the prison economy as much as we can and those things that we don't want to provide. So I think you know, prisoners should have much cheaper phone service, for example, and prison should allow them to do that so they don't have to go to the illicit market to get cell phones. If the prison doesn't want to start selling heroin or, or marijuana, then we need to use kind of smart and effective regulation to, to try to suppress you know, that, that type of activity. Of who's doing the tattooing? Yeah, well, I think there's definitely people who are, are known for their ability and skill at, at doing tattoos in prison. And uh, I don't know if they are restricted, I don't know how they're restricted and who they will give tattoos to or not. What was the second part of your question? Like, for example, prison gangs, like, do you think you can get into prison with these kind of 
Yeah, so certainly in, in California, you know, the, the, the most serious prison gangs have influence over the street gangs, and those street gangs have influence in state prisons and youth facilities. Um, they, the gangs have an incentive to generate um, encouragement, identity with the types of activities that they're involved with. Right? They want people who are going to participate in helping them to control resources, to push their markets, to, to, to generate you know, ta what essentially are taxes for the sale of drugs. Uh, so yeah, I don't consider them to be a very um, helpful or benevolent effect on, on the youth of California. Um, I didn't talk about that, uh, but th there's uh, gangs use extensive rules to identify different people's roles in the organizations, to define what the rules are for interacting with other people, and um, they're sophisticated in the sense that we would assume for some reason that they wouldn't have those, but in every organization, at churches, schools, businesses, nonprofits, they always have rules about what roles different people are supposed to play what their responsibilities are, what their tenure in a particular position is, what the penalty for not providing those rules are. And you see many of those existing in, in, in the prison community. And the reason is because it helps solve the problem, is that if you want a bunch of people to jointly work together for some common end, it helps to provide rules and to guide that cooperation and coordination. The county jails have a prison gang presence. Um, the, the challenge of county jails for inmates is that it's much more transitory than state prisons. So people typically will be there before they've been charged or for, before they've been convicted or for less than a year. And what that means is there's a lot of turnover there. There's not a lot of stability. So these structures of social control that emerge and work pretty well in the prison setting, much less tenuous, much less robust. They're not different. Uh, they're, they're, they're essentially um, subject to the same constraints. Uh, inmates have the same demands, and you see similar, similar solutions. I think um, that's a great point, and, and you know, one way to think about your question is to ask, what incentive do prison officials have to collect and invest resources, you know, funds, to break up the types of social structures here? Uh, some, some prison officials, correctional officers, say that the gangs make their job easier because the gangs regulate conflict and resolve disputes in a less visible way. And if the alternative is that they had to do that, then it's easier for them. It's less costly for them to do that. A second related question that you're asking is, what's the social benefit of reducing prison gang activity? And there's these costs that are dispersed. People who are going to recidivate, you know, re-offend re once they release, or are going to be more likely to commit crimes. That's a very general cost that's felt by people in the community. 
and that doesn't factor into the, the decision calculus of prison officials in choosing prison policy. So that cost is something that they don't bear, and so they don't respond to that incentive. There's a related issue in the question of how to control crime. A community, a county, in any of the 58 counties in California can control crime in a variety of ways, but the two most prominent are to hire police or to send people to prison. Both of those control or reduce crime. If you want to hire police, you have to tax local voters to fund police. If you want to send people to prison, all of the state's taxpayers pay for that. So electorally, there's a misincentive that causes us to use prisons too much. And it comes right to that point that you raised, which is that if the costs aren't aligned with the benefits faced by the decision maker, then we're going to choose bad policy.